Okie dokie. Uh, so today's topic is going to cover like the social use of language for our language topic, but then um, the statistical analysis is MDS. And starting with semantic vector space models, I said that everything from then to the end of the semester was going to be way less about p-values and way more about interpretive dance. And this week is no exception. So uh, the last two topics were on vector space models, building a picture of the data. Um, this is the same idea, but we, we're really limited to two or three dimensions. So it's really handy for, for creating like a low dimensional picture of the data. And so language topic wise, we're going to cover dialect. Uh, and I love this word. And the, the, crazy, the best thing about traveling for me is listening to people talk and thinking about cross-linguistic questions. Um, I also asked a lot of questions about Dutch culture because it was very odd to me that a uh, European country, many of them also speak English, right? They have a native language. They also speak English because they're better at um, um, being multilingual than the United States anyways. Uh, but I swear I didn't meet a single Dutch person who didn't speak English. And so I asked one of them, like, when do you guys start learning English? Because your English is better than mine. It's my native language, right? Um, and the uh, person was explaining to me, like, oh, we learn in school, but every TV movie uh, is all in English. It's just subbed in Dutch. It's like subtitles. And they don't dub it, meaning they overlay the voice. It's like, so you just hear English all the time. And I'm like, oh, that's an interesting like, cultural question of like, why, is, why don't they dub it in Dutch? Right? Um, so we're going to cover dialect. And I have a funny story about Van Gogh for that that I learned on my trip. Uh, and really, this is getting into language variety. So even within a single language, there are shades of the language, so to speak. So we'll see um, different. Um, Kind of sub languages, and sometimes those sub languages become their own language. So for a while, Portuguese was kind of a subset of Spanish and became its own language. And I'll talk a little bit about sociolinguistics, and I really like this chapter because it really helps cover like culture and language together. Uh, so if we think about languages, there's actually a hierarchy of them. So um, there are full languages, English. But um, often languages start as a pidgin. And pidgin is a new language that's developing when two languages kind of come together. So the joke about English is that it's three different languages in a trench coat pretending to be uh, a, a real language. So uh, Latin, German, and I forget the other big influence. Um, but a pidgin is where sort of culturally two different groups that speak very different languages come together and they have to communicate so we get a kind of a new mishmash of languages. So Tinglish, it's technically considered a mix of Thai and English. Uh, I'm from Texas, so the Spanglish, where we get the Spanish and um, English mix. Uh, but this happens in lots of different languages. It's not just English. Um, and so you get kind of this halfway in between. But the vocabulary tends to be dominated by the language that is more spoken or has more money, so to speak. So many of these sociolinguistic trends are often tied to status as well. Right? Um, so why, does, why is English one of the most well-spoken languages uh, well, that might have something to do with U.S. cultural, uh, uh, not cultural, but like GDP dominance, right? Uh, and wars and all this other stuff. But this idea is that um, when we form new languages or decide what language is sort of global, these are tied to political events as well. Uh, as it develops into a full language, though, what you see is that you have the grammar of the original language, the language is, and it, it moves away from that. So it stops being just kind of like a Lego block of language one and language two, and just sort of piece them together. 
and starts becoming its own separate thing. Right? So what we see is that the grammar doesn't quite match, the verb conjugations are a little different, maybe the word order, the, the words that we're using, you get new words out of this, and so you kind of see it um, become its own, um, it's like a child developing, it becomes its own person. And as it develops into a, a new language, it's called a creole. Okay. Uh, creole is a pidgin that has developed into the mother tongue. When we say mother tongue, we mean language one. So your native language in a community. So this would be the preferred language. Right? So you might speak multiple ones, but this would be the preferred one. Okay. Um, so Louisiana Creole, with the big C, is a blend of English and French that you find in uh, parts of Louisiana, little, little bits of Texas and Arkansas, kind of depends, um, that became the mother tongue of a community. Okay. This is really happening when we've got um, United States, kind of, and then we bought Louisiana. There's this huge French Catholic influence going on because of imports and Lafayette and all that jazz. Um, and those languages really started to blend. Now, often people think of this as um, kind of like hillbilly. Like if you've seen that um, Swamp People show <laughs> that was on the History Channel, I think, for a while, uh, a lot of what they're speaking is really fast Creole. And so it just sounds like a bunch of like gibberish because it's actually not really English. Um, but when this happens, most of the vocabulary is still from one language, it dominates one language. So most of Louisiana Creole is actually, I think it's mostly English with just a heavy dash of French. Um, so we still have the vocabulary, but those grammatical functions, it's like it's developed into its own complete language. So there's sort of steps to grammar um, where uh, at some point it stops being a pigeon, starts being a full language. Um, so getting into dialect, it's not really that it's its own distinct language, it's a variety of a language that's spoken generally in one area of a country. Um, and so we'll, uh, in the U.S. we can talk about the northern dialect or the southern dialect, um, and then west, the west half of the states just look, doesn't have anything, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, often this is tied to accent. But accent is not really the end-all be-all of dialect. Um, and so if I asked you, I ask people who are mostly not from the States, but if you can think about the area of the country that would be considered accentless. And it might surprise you because um, the accentless uh, English is technically Midwestern English. So Southwestern Bell was the first big telephone company. For a long time, they had a monopoly on phones. Um, they were trying to find a way to record those, like, uh, I can only think error message, but, like, you know, if you called a phone number and the person didn't pick up, it would ring, like, 37 times, and then, by like, the person you're calling is not answering. Please try to call again later. They were trying to... to record that in such a way that it didn't confuse people who had different accents. And so they actually picked Nebraska <laughs> as the accentless uh, English, uh, which often surprises people. I feel like um, it seems odd that Midwesterners have like um, truly American English. Right? Um, but let's not confuse accent dialect. Accent is only the inflection on a word pronunciation. And so if I was to say dialect like I should, as a true Southerner, it would be dialect. So Southern uh, U.S. <clears throat> has really strong nasals, and so eyes are particularly bad. Uh, I have trouble with this sometimes. If I'm tired, I'm not paying attention, I will say uh, things like nan, like it just happens, pa, right? So there's these really long I nasal sounds. It's a distinct Southern uh, um, enunciation. If you want to hear like truly Southern uh, American speech, there's a podcast called Southern Fried True Crime. I love true crime podcasts. 
and she has the most magnificent southern accent. Um, or if you watch a lot of TV, uh, Nancy Grace, it's a really great example. Right? Um, <clears throat> so the South is considered to have like a very uh, like a drawn out vowels. Right? Northern American accents tend to have clipped vowels. So if you've ever heard someone from Boston speak, you get a lot of uh, things like calf or car. So they're clipping off the vowels or the phonemes so that they're shorter. Okay. Southerners draw them out. All right. So dialect, though, is accent, but also word choice. If you've ever seen those cool maps where people say different words, um, so I would call anything that's a soda like so, my, my Diet Coke here, I would call every one of those things a Coke. Um, so a Sprite is a Coke, a Dr. Pepper is a Coke, <laughs> Pepsi still a Coke. So it's kind of like the global term for a soda. Um, most of the U.S. says soda, Southerners say Coke, Northerners say pop. Um, and so those kind of regional word choices are also uh, part of dialect, not just the accent. Okay. And there's tons of these cool maps about where people say things. Um, uh, grocery carts is another one, like cart versus a buggy, sneakers versus tennis shoes. There's a, there's a big list of them. And I'm, I'm sure that I know that occurs in other languages. I just know the ones for English. Um, and then we can get even more into cultural differences. So we could say a minority dialect. And so sometimes dialects are tied to, I use the word cultural group here, but you can assume this is a race ethnic group or um, any kind of group of people that associate based on some sort of formal culture. Right? Um, and those ideas can totally overlap. So there are parts of the country where there are more black people, right? Um, and so there might be a special regional dialect that's also a minority dialect. So these are not totally separate things. And what we're going to talk about today mostly is black English vernacular. For a long time, this was called a bonix till people realized that was not like a socially acceptable term. It's been called Black English Vernacular for just as long. It's just this BEV is the more formal academic version. So you might have heard it called a Bonix before. You shouldn't call it that. <laughs> uh, it's not appropriate. But it's used as a marker of identity. Right? And so you'll see this play out in political or um, sort of I hate to call these Twitter fights, but that idea of like uh, using language as an identity marker. And um, there are certain words that certain groups of people cannot say. So like racial slurs are okay if it's within a um, uh, regional group or minority group. They're not okay from the outside coming in. Uh, you see this also with LGBT culture. And so um, within the dialect group, there are identi these identity markers. And if we look at those across time, what we can see, like especially because Britain just kind of colonized everywhere, each indigenous group uh, has these markers within the, the language. So they're speaking you know, uh, British English, but they have a special version of it to hang on to their cultural identity. And so we're mostly going to talk about BEV and how uh, this has actually come up recently again. So, it's, but um, this idea of using language as a marker for intelligence um, or as a way to categorize people for political reasons. Okay. So uh, we're mostly going to talk, uh, talk about the pioneering work of William LaBeouf. LaBeouf is a uh, famous sociolinguistics sociolinguist, right? Who was doing most of his work in the 70s, but it's still relevant. Right? And so the bell curve. I feel like this book was actually published in the 90s. Um, the research I'm gonna talk about is in the uh, 70s, though. Bell curve book. I can't. They were occurring almost at the same time, but I feel like. 
Yeah, it didn't get published until the 90s. So here's the original book. Um, but I think a lot of this work was occurring before that. So we're kind of talking about two different time periods. Um, and I'll try to like kind of lay out how this happened. So in the 90s, um, some people published a book called The Bell Curve. And these ideas have been around before that. You guys are probably familiar with the bell curve thinking about normal distributions. So when we measure IQ, um, and there are lots of problems with this, and so I'll just kind of say, if we're measuring IQ and we think we're doing it right, so not even getting into the like issues of our, what, what are we actually measuring, right? um, what we find is that there are several distinct distributions based on ethnic racial lines. We tend to find that Asians have higher IQs, uh, sort of white people are the, uh, the benchmark here, um, then uh, Latinx folks and black individuals tend to have lower IQs. And there's, what, you know, what is the, what is the reason for this? Um, and um, if we think that IQ is innate, it's genetic, there does seem to be a large genetic component to it. Um, it's not um, totally genetic, but heavily genetic. Okay. And so if it's genetic and we see these differences, that means, sort of therefore, um, that there are certain skin tones, in a sense, that are just genetically uh, inferior. Okay. So... <clears throat> This was really heavily used and it still is unfortunately used as a, a kind of way to suggest that um, white people are somehow more superior or better because we have better genetics and we're smarter and all this other stuff. Um, when, uh, and then the explanation for why children might do poorly on like standardized school tests is because they got a low IQ and they're black. Then black people just have lower IQs because genetics. Right? It's kind of an easy thing to pass off. And so um, the, the Bell Curve book argues this point, sort of a genetic superiority um, argument. And, and, and the first versions of it were much more much stronger. The later versions of it kind of back off on this because there's a lot of criticisms here for, I hope, what are very obvious reasons. Um, and tying this back into language, it's that these poor language skills that we see are because they have low IQ, and they have low IQ because of genetics. Um, <clears throat> At this time, Lavabov is like, uh, what? <laughs> Do, huh? So um, his work really pioneered looking at black English vernacular. He studied inner city kids in Chicago and um, was, a, as far as I understand, was a white guy. I can't remember now. Let's check it out. So you can understand that maybe a white guy trying to study, yeah. Uh, inner city black kids, hmm, maybe this um, doesn't go so well, but he figured out a way to do this. And his argument was language issues, these issues that you see children have, um, where teachers would try and say, well, we shouldn't, uh, it's not my fault that these kids are scoring low on these tests and our school isn't meeting its standard. It's that they can't speak English, right? Um, and his argument was, well, it's not really that they can't speak English. It's just there are lots of these other outside sociocultural influences that impact the language that you are seeing. Um, so first problem, there's a power imbalance with a teacher. Right? So if you're a kid, the teacher is in charge, right? They're much taller than you are. I'm thinking like young children. Um, they're... Uh, uh, sort of a sense of authority and if they're telling you that you're not speaking good English well maybe you aren't right and if we study and we get kids to actually talk to us so we use this whole the article that I've included today has this whole thing about Cheetos <laughs> because he would like bribe bribe these children with food basically 
and and instead of you know standing there and talking to them, he'd lay on the floor so that they were taller than he was. And he, you know, during the 70s, hired black research assistants, which would have been really unheard of in like higher level academics, um, and and really fought to change the balance of authority, right? So that they kids basically would talk to him, like, I want to know more about you and your language. And I think at the time, and even later, his work really was uh, kind of regarded as like, wait, what? Because it went against what people had kind of assumed, given that we think, you know, your own language is the best, and these kids don't know how to talk. If we break language down and study it as, um, ooh, brain fart. If we study it in a cognitive processing or information systems kind of way, what you actually find is that black English vernacular is just as expressive. So if we think about communicating the point, it's just as expressive. It's also more economical. So you get more bang for your buck. So if we study this kind of like anthropology wise, it's actually better language because you're doing more for less. And I don't know that that idea worked went over so well, but uh, has been well supported in later research. Um, and so it really begs the question of like, why should we consider middle class English, okay, uh, which is what most school teachers are speaking, okay, and sort of um, especially middle class white English as intelligent. Right? Why is that the standard against which we are judging? It's actually recently, it was like on Twitter today, uh, yesterday, there was a, a whole thread on like, name the first time that you had uh, like a black male teacher. And I was sitting there like, uh, never? College? Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we've, we've we spent a lot, like right now we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion. And so I think what LeBov was trying to do in the 70s was be like, yo, you got to think about these things. They're not, the problem isn't that these kids are dumb. The problem is that we have all these social pressures that keep them from excelling in the way you expect. If you're really interested in this, Radio Lab right now is doing a whole series of, called G, like just the letter G. Uh, and the very first one in it actually talks about why you can't give kids intelligence, black kids intelligence tests in California. Uh, and it's based on a lot of this stuff. It's okay. If you're like, oh, this is really fascinating, um, I'd recommend the Radio Lab to you. Um, <clears throat> so kind of to sum this up, it's like really mostly about the social interaction. Right? <clears throat> um, and so when you're interacting with children, they assume that you're in charge. Right? Because you're bigger than they are, and you're the adult. And so there's this um, cognitive idea called stereotype threat. And stereotype threat is when um, there are perceived stereotypes about you based on the way you look. Okay. So for women, there's a stereotype that we can't be good at math. Um, and then you think about like gamer culture, uh, or even kind of the sort of culture of being in the STEM field. Right. And when those stereotypes are activated, you can often have poor performance because you're responding to that threat. Okay. So with, uh, in this black English vernacular research, um, the threat was that, that they weren't, that they were done. Okay. And so they'd act accordingly. And this doesn't mean that that's the way you are. You're just responding to that implicit bias that's going on. Okay. And I think if you kind of look at uh, current what sort of cop culture, you'd also see some of these exact same things going on. Um, if, you, however, you change the situation and de-emphasize the threat and sort of even out the power balance, what, what he found was that the verbal behavior is equal. So the problem is in intelligence. Obviously, intelligence can play a factor, but that's across any person. The problem is uh, social, social pressures. Um, and so... He, like to me, I love William LaBeouf stuff because one, he can write, he can just make sense, it's very clear. Um, but 
he also really points to the fact that when we're researching language in this way, what we're actually studying is culture. And so I find it very hard to disambiguate language and culture. They're, they're very heavily tied. Um, and so we can't completely take these two things apart and say, well, you know, the person's language skills are X, which means Y. Like you're also dealing with all these other cultural biases. Um, and so if we say this, if we can't understand someone's language, um, it, they're often considered inferior. And I think a lot of you who probably have had, unfortunately, have had this experience of speak English or go home. Um, because there is often this bias against people whose English appears broken, right? Um, when in reality, it's sort of odd, it's such an odd thing to think personally because, um, man, you're speaking multiple languages, right? You're like communicating, you got like six, six languages bouncing around in your head, and the people who are saying speak English or go home often can only speak one. So I find this very um, dumb idea. But uh, this is kind of that in-group, out-group behavior. Well, you're not like me, so therefore you must be um, sort of different from me, and that tends to manifest in less important than me. Okay. Right. <clears throat> so uh, two examples. Uh, Stephen Colbert is my first one. So Stephen Colbert is from South Carolina. And he has this really famous interview where he talks about being a southerner, because that would be part of the southern U.S., and uh, especially that dialect. And he talks about how he had to do his best to get rid of his dialect so that people wouldn't consider him stupid. Because there's a lot of the sort of redneck uh, southerners or just all hillbillies kind of feel. I think it's going away slowly. But... Um, on TV, especially when he started, anyone with that kind of accent was, you know, it, was, it didn't look good. Um, and I think the fact that TV displays a lot more and different types of people now has helped, but he said he spent a lot of time trying to get rid of his accent. Okay. Um, and then my other Dutch example, um, <clears throat> talking about uh, Van Gogh. So uh, I went to, as in my conference, I'm talking to a lot of people, mostly Germans for some reason, but we were talking about how Dutch was what I imagined German should sound like. It has a lot of very hard syllables, and so it sounds uh, kind of mean. And so at least in American culture, when you watch, watch movies where they display, per, per, portray Germans, the language sounds very, like, um, lots of C's, lots of, it sounds mean. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to say bad. It just sounds angry. Angry is the word I'm looking for because it has a lot of hard syllable sounds. And when I went to Germany, I was like, wow, this isn't anything like you see or hear on TV. That's kind of amazing. And then the first day in, in Rotterdam was where we were at. Uh, it was like, wow, this sounds like what I think German should sound like. So I was talking to uh, someone. They were like, ask a Dutch person so they van go for you. Okay. So I'm talking to somebody. I'm like, you know, the famous painter person. And uh, apparently there's this sort of regional dialect where you can tell where people are from in the Netherlands by um, how hard they pronounce the G. So in America, we're just like, G, that, it's gone, right? <laughs> it's Van Gogh. But uh, in the Netherlands, it's like Van Gogh. I can't do it. <laughs> but um, uh, the G sort of creates this like, lower friction in the larynx kind of noise. And I just remember being like, do what? <laughs> Say that again? Um, and they thought I was making fun of them. But the idea is that there are these, like you can tell that there's these, uh, where someone's from by what they just, how they say their G phoneme. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, sorry, that is my phone telling me not to go outdoors because there's a flash flood warning. So, hopefully you guys aren't getting the crazy bad weather. <clears throat> right. um, so every language has this and it has these sort of cultural things. Um, the person telling me the story kind of implied that the people who don't pronounce the hard G are kind of 
inferior because they're not from Holland, which would be the north half of the country. I just had to laugh because I was like, I'm literally giving this presentation to my students next week. Um, but yeah, so a couple of examples on cultural interactions with phoneme production. Okay. All right, getting into the data though, here, let me turn on the light in here. The storm is rolling in and it's getting very dark in here. Um, <clears throat> let's look at varieties of English. And so there's a data set called the E-Wave, which is the Electronic World Atlas of Varieties of English. And it has, in the data set that's included in the Arling package, 20 randomly selected features from 76 different varieties of English. These are things that I did not realize there were so many different versions. Um, and then we made fun of the Australians on this trip because they were, I'm like, I know we're speaking the same language right now. What are you saying? Right? Uh, like one of them, God bless her. Louisiana. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Talking about Louisiana, the state. Um, I was like, there's no R in Louisiana. <laughs> so uh, different kind of varieties like that. And the, the features are kind of all over the map, but the data set also includes latitude and longitude. So we're going to actually map latitude and longitude, but if you look at the book chapter, it talks about how you might map the features as well. Um, so all of these, like F1, F7, or whatever, if you look at the help for this, you can see what they are. And they're just different coded phoneme structures, cultural varieties. Um, so they either have it or they don't, or they're type A, B, or C, so it kind of depends. Um, so here's Australian English, Australian vernacular English. Um, vernacular is a really popular phrase when talking about variety. So it's kind of what the data looks like. <clears throat> And for this example, this it, it is not necessary to um, always do this on latitude and longitude. But the nice thing about looking at an example using lat long is that you can actually understand dimensions a little better in an MDS. Um, so when you do this analysis for the homework, it's going to be just real data. Um, it won't be latitude and longitude because I, I can't find a good data set for that. But um, let's map these onto the world. So I'm going to use the R world map library and um, pull up a map. I'm going to plot that map. And I'm going to add the latitude and longitude points. And this is very similar to those snake plots and everything else that we've been doing. Um, so we're going to just add different colors and we're going to color them. This code, I feel like. I pulled it, kind of edited it a little bit from the book, and it only like half works correctly. You'll see in a second. I haven't quite figured out uh, exactly what I'm doing wrong. If I need to add 20, for some reason the PCH values work better if they're in the 20s. I don't know. We'll see, you'll see in a minute. Um, but this is how you make that plot. You would color them, uh, just tell it to give you different plots. Uh, and we're plotting them by type. Um, back up a little bit. Uh, type is a column that is out there that kind of maps uh, what version of English they are. So let me show you guys. Let me run this. Do you wave? Okay. So we've got the row names are the 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 label. So here's some pigeons in here. Okay. All of these different. Uh, dialect markers, region right, is where it is in the world. Uh, type here is 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 the like level of the language. So it could be Creole, it could be a pidgin. High contact L1 varieties are things that um, are now the mother tongue of the language, and where you had a lot of interaction between English and the the original language. So you'll see this in a lot of Places where Britain colonized, okay. uh, indigenized L2 varieties are people who are speaking this as their second language, okay. and then your sort of traditional L1 varieties are going to mostly be um, 
American and British English varieties. All right, so we're gonna color this by type and put on a pretty legend. So let's look at that plot. And so it like kind of graphs two or three of them as the same one. And there's some red squares over here that aren't on the graph of the plot. So I don't know, I need to figure out what I'm doing slightly wrong, but we can look at where they actually are mapped onto. Right, so some traditional L1 varieties in Australia. You got some over here in the US. High contact L1s are different uh, dialect versions. And then it would be helpful if we knew what some of these other ones are. But if you just kind of look at the map, it's clear that you can see, to me anyways, you can see Europe up here, right? Uh, and the colonization that Britain did okay. in the US, but uh, like in parts of Africa, uh, India and uh, Australia. So a lot of like culture and politics going on there. Uh, this is just for fun though. Be what we're really going to do is do multidimensional scaling. Okay. So this is a descriptive um, visual technique. It's not a cluster analysis, but it allows you to cluster things in low dimensional space. A cluster analysis can create high dimensional spaces, meaning many clusters. Um, semantic vector space is the most high dimensional thing that you can do, where you can have many different, 400 different dimensions if you wanted. Um, Multidimensional scaling kind of pairs that down to 1D, 2D, or 3D space. Um, and so you map the different variables together in these low dimensional spaces to see which ones kind of come together. Given that we're doing this in latitude and longitude, what we should see is that they, they group together by their latitude and longitude. Okay. We could also group them by type or any of these little um, uh, dialect markers. And the way I've always thought about this, it's actually, uh, it's not a social network analysis, but it's that kind of idea of like, Things that are similar tend to group together in space, multidimensional space. Things that are not similar tend to not. And so if I'm trying to, if I have a map of the school cafeteria, the people who sit together at a table are more similar than people who sit at different tables. All right, a couple types of multidimensional scaling. So there's metric. Um, this is where you're going to represent distance as precisely as possible. Versus, um, and the main one is classical, where it might be called a principal coordinates analysis sometimes. Um, I'm not going to use that term because then it gets confused with principal components analysis. So that's kind of tricky terminology there. Uh, and then non-metric. And this is where you do this on very heavily skewed data or um, data that is categorical, where everything is sort of represented as um, ranks instead of uh, the raw variable. And this is used when rank is more important than the original distance. So it's kind of the non-parametric version. So this is the difference between regression and log regression, basically. Slow, click, slow. There we go. So some things that we need to consider. So we want to represent our data as best as possible. This is true of every analysis. We're building a model that represents the data. Um, and so we can look at stress uh, as a measure of how much information is lost by moving the data into a low dimensional space. Okay. Um, so I don't think my power will go out, but this storm is apparently pretty nasty. <laughs> So if it does, I'll see you guys later. Just FYI, so if I just like disappear and don't come back, that's hopefully not what's gonna happen, but I can hear the wind blowing and uh, we've had a couple of these really bad storms and we eh, want once in a while lose power. So just let me know, uh, hopefully not. <clears throat> Anyways, so stress is information that's lost when you build a low dimensional space. And so we don't want our models to be stressed, essentially, just like we don't want people to be stressed. So we'll see the difference between um, representing geography as a 2D space when it's really 3D, right? So there's this idea that the maps of the world are never perfect because by flattening them, we totally screw things up. 
So a lower stress score is a better fit to the model right? because it's less stressed out. That's the way I think about this. I don't know why they call it stress. Um, I don't know why they don't just use fit indices, but you know, I didn't make this up. So, um, in theory, a multidimensional scale can be as many dimensions as there are variables minus one, uh, just like a cluster analysis. But in practice, that would be insane. So what people do is with these, we're trying to create the most parsimonious model, or the simplest model possible. And so you can't really in interpret 4D space very well. And you certainly can't interpret 30D space. So most people stick to one to three. And if you want to move up into the higher spaces, you do an analysis um, like principal components analysis or exploratory factor analysis, which is what we'll do next week. And simpler solutions are always better because they're easier to explain. And so what we'll do is balance stress and simplicity. So let's try one. So we're looking at dialects here, or different varieties of English. And um, in a multidimensional scale, we have to have distance. So with cluster analysis, we had the same issue where we had to put in the distances um, instead of the raw data. Okay. So we're going to calculate distance. And in this case, uh, since we're working with latitude and longitude, we're going to calculate distance as literal distance um, because that's the same idea as calculating maybe Euclidean or Manhattan distance. For the assignment, you'll use Euclidean distance. And we'll talk more about that assignment next week because it is um, also tied to principal components. So you'll do an MDS and then an EFA, for example. <clears throat> so here I have created... Uh, earth distances, like uh, the straight line, if I could fly like a bird and take a straight line between two places, what would the distance be? Uh, and I turned off miles. I think it's in kilometers. Don't quote me on that. But anyways, we're making it into a distance measure. Okay. So when you do a multidimensional, <laughs> the main point to get here, if I could talk, is that when you do a multidimensional scale, it needs to be distances as the data, not the raw data. Now, we're going to use CMD scale, this is in base R, put in your distances. You pick a number of dimensions. So if you wanted to run this in three dimensions, you just do k equals three instead. Eigenvalues equals true, just so that we can see them. So let's look at those. Uh, I feel like we've talked about eigenvalues, but I could be wrong, so I'm just going to reiterate this. So eigenvalues are a mathematical representation of variance. So they, um, they're not, they're, I don't want to call them scale-free because they're not totally scale-free, but the idea is that they, it's not like R squared where it's like 20% of the variance, 30% of the variance. You can convert, um, but the raw score for an eigenvalue is just a representation of like dimension one accounts for, you know, eight points of variance for whatever eight points is. Dimension two might be two points of variance. Um, so in there raw form, I don't find them super useful, except that they're helpful in determining what is the sort of optimal number of dimensions. Okay. And so you'll get k minus 1, meaning variables minus 1. So in this case, we're looking at the, the varieties of English. So this would be 75, so 76 minus 1. Okay. Only a few of them will be big, okay. because we can actually group these things together. And to interpret them, we're going to look at a scree plot. So we're going to use these for a couple weeks in a row. Um, so a scree plot is a graph of eigenvalues that helps you determine the optimal number of dimensions. And so I'm going to plot the scree plot here. And the interesting thing about these is that they actually go negative, which is very odd because variance can't be negative. <laughs> But essentially, at some point, you represented all the variants, and it just, like, essentially the last several variables just end up being a mess. So ignore this over here. Mainly, you want to look at this. So a scree plot, um, I think, I feel like, let's give you a better view here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's look at some images. All right, here's we go. So I've often seen these used more in factor analysis, but 
what you're trying to do in a scree plot is look for the scree. Okay, so this is a, an odd word that I don't feel like a whole lot of people know, except when you're talking about this kind of stuff. Um, the scree is, is the, the down part of the hill where it sort of stops. So if you throw a rock down a hill, this is where the rock would stop rolling. Okay. And so it, it's sometimes called the elbow roll, like your arm is an elbow, um, where you're looking for the point at which it bends and counting the number of, of eigenvalues above that for uh, finding the optimal number of factors. So if I look at our plot here, the scree is clearly here. So this is where if I actually play connect the dots instead of a bar graph, um, there's no, uh, it levels out. Right? And so that would be one, two, three factors. So I ran this as a two-dimensional plot, but I probably should do a three-dimensional plot to accurately represent the data. Okay. So you're looking for where the factors sort of drop and level out, and you count the number of eigenvalues above that. So I'm going to plot the two-dimensional plot, and we'll look at its stress values, and then see how much better we get by looking at a three-dimensional plot because we've just determined that three is probably going to do us a, a little bit better, which makes sense because these are latitudes and longitudes. So to plot this, I'm going to put in the points. The points just tell it where to graph. You could do, also do this with ggplot by using the points. Okay, this is kind of the low res version. Okay. N is a blank plot. Give it a title. And then add the text with the row names because the row names are what each variable is. Um, this is very similar to our snake plots that we did last week, okay, or two weeks, several weeks ago. I don't, I barely know what day it is because jet lag is real, <laughs> so um, forgive me for that. When we did snake plots, okay, so here's what that looks like. And by looking at this, if we kind of could zoom it in and out of the different areas, this is a really great place that Plotly would be handle ha helpful because you can manipulate Plotly plots. Um, but we kind of went super low tech into base R. What we see is kind of a globe, right? And um, here's Hawaii hanging out by itself. Right? We can find North America. Here's Chicago. So this is North America, right? A little bit of South America. And then at some point you can see Africa over here and India. So it's actually as if we were looking at a globe straight from the top or the bottom, I guess. So in 2D space, what we've essentially represented is around the globe. So kind of a proof that this works. Right? We're representing latitude and longitude flattened out, but from the poles. Um, so that empty middle is because there's, you can't have a language in the center of the, of the Earth. Okay. And it gives us a nice split between the eastern and western hemispheres. Uh, it would be better if we tried three dimensions to see if we could get that split between northern and southern hemispheres. So let's do that. I ran a 3D plot by just changing K to 3 now. And with RGL library, again, I think this would be much better in Plotly because I feel like Plotly is just much prettier graphs for this. But matching the book here in the RGL library, you can make this plot. To do, 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 to do, do, do. I'm going to find it. Give me just a second. Here. It kind of disappears when I run this in Markdown. But now if I run it, it's this little screen. We can make this better. So in three-dimensional space, and these are actually manipulatable, now we can see the globe much better. So let me find... Here's the U.S. over here, right? So U.S., um, New Zealand, so here's Australia. So we're actually getting this, the, a much better picture of those languages across the globe because now we have the Northern and Southern Hemisphere and the Eastern and Western Hemisphere represented. Okay. Now, if we weren't doing this with latitude and longitude data, I mean, like, this is like an easy interpretation. Look, it plotted lat long correctly, right? What do people actually do with MDS? 
let's say you want to um, plot a dialect by their use of specific words. Okay. This is something we've kind of done multiple times, like let versus do in our example from um, Dutch. Uh, so let's say you're trying to figure out the cultural variety by the use of words. Instead of plotting these by line and longitude, I would plot them by their word usage, and I would just look at which ones cluster together on a graph. Okay. So what ends up happening is you get these little uh, groupings where a bunch of them kind of hang out together um, in the top right, that's the top left, but the, in one of the corners of the data. Okay. And next week we'll make some plots of uh, the different factor analyses, and you'll see kind of what I'm talking about. This is just kind of neat because we can look at what we know sh it should look like. So a 2D picture of latitude and longitude versus a 3D picture of latitude versus long and longitude. So the results are almost kind of expected here, but with a real MDS, I could then look at where they cluster together in space and be like, these are all the same because they all have the same characteristics. Um, to know if or which model is good, right, we have fit statistics. So a goodness of fit is kind of similar to an R squared. Uh, most people use the the second one. Uh, you can pick either one. I, I cannot, from the health guide, figure out what is really that difference between them. But either one that I pick, I can tell that the 3D model is better because we're getting way more um, of a, we're getting a better fit to the data when we include that third dimension. Duh, right? Uh, stress, though, is the more commonly reported statistic. And this is the unfortunate formula, right? So it's a measure of the distances, the real distances, minus the predicted distances from the model squared. That should sound very familiar. That's the formula for standard deviation, right? X minus the mean squared or residuals in a, in a linear regression model, the actual score minus the predicted score squared, okay. divided by those uh, real distances squared. Okay. And this is just uh, for each distance in each dimension. Okay. And then take the square root. Okay. So this is how you math that. In R, there's no good function. So the stress for a 3D model, I did 3D first for some reason, sorry, is lower than the stress for a 2D model, which implies that the two, a 3D model is better, okay? Because lower stress is better. I think that's an easy thing to remember, right? Um, where, and that matches our goodness of fit statistics. So we should use 3D when we're talking about 3D objects. Um, and so you can also interpret them. There are some uh, characteristics that people use are like kind of cutoff scores where above a 0.2 is poor, but between 0.2 and 0.1 is fair, so we're actually only in that fair category at re reconstructing the data. Uh, between 0.1 and 0.5 is good, below 0.05 is excellent. Okay. So stress is very similar to uh, um, the residual statistics that we'll talk about next week when we look at uh, factor analyses. So if you've ever done any kind of structural equation modeling or um, factor components analysis, uh, this is the idea of a residual statistic, where we have the real data, the uh, model data, and you want them to match as close as possible, so stress is a measure of mismatch. Okay? So a perfectly matched model would have zero stress, and then the higher the scores get, the more mismatch, or the more different they are. Okay? Whereas things like goodness of fit are the other way around. It's how much those two things match. Um, I find this dumb that, that we have both of these, but anytime you see a goodness of fit statistic um, where it says good in it, the, the value should get closer to one, the better they are, because it's a measure of match. And then anytime you see residual statistics, like stress, um, I call these badness of fit measures, the closer to zero they are, the better they are, because they're a measure of mismatch. So where is the mismatch? So similar to kind of a snake plot, we're going to create what's called a shepherd plot. 
Um, I think shepherd pots are interesting, but their utility... Eh, mostly because um, I think they're good at seeing kind of quickly if a model's really bad. If a model's sort of like in the middle, I don't know that I think that they give you that much useful information, but I'm going to show you them. And so it's a, a essentially a residuals plot, and we've looked at those before for linear and logistic regression. And so it shows you the uh, distance from the D score minus the D uh, fit score. Um, so if everything is actually measured perfectly, the, all the dots will line up in a straight little line, just like a QQ plot. Um, the further they move away from the line, the more mismatch there is. So that x-axis shows you the distance between each pair of dialects. So this is going to get crazy real quick. And the y-axis shows you the estimated distance between each pair of them. And so if, like I said, they're measured perfectly, uh, it's a one-to-one -one kind of situation. Uh, I already said that. Okay. And outliers are these dots that are really far away from the diagonal. Okay. And uh, what we could do is if we have a bunch of these, I would tell you to plot those uh, really high numbers and label them to see which combinations they are. Because it's not like the dot is one particular row in the data. The dot is one cell. So every um, when you do distances, right, you're doing every row in this example to every other row. And so you've got a map of everything compared to every other thing. And if you're plotting the outliers and there's one particular one that comes up over and over and over again, so let's say it's Australian English for this example, then I would figure out why that one row is the problem. Like take it out of the model and try it again, see what happens. Um, so this is similar to one of the assignments where JCN, one of the variables was really wrong. And if you took it out of the model, it worked much better for cluster analysis. Um, similar idea. So let's look at those. So to create a shepherd plot, you use from the mass library the shepherd function. You put in the real distances, then you put in the model distances, um, and then plot that. And you can add these uh, line types that just kind of this just makes the dots and adds the proper lines to it. Okay. So let's look at that plot. And this is a little squished because of the way it's printing. So let's look at it here. I think if you make it just a bit more square, right, what you see is it's actually pretty straight. There's maybe a slight curvature here, but uh, you know most of these dots are very close to a one-to-one -one line, so where x equals y, um, where the distance and the model distance are the same. And if I wanted to figure out outliers, I would mostly kind of be looking at these little dots out here. But 76 different rows times 76 different rows, right, is a lot of combinations. <laughs> so if I wanted to know, like, oh, there's some really bad, like, dots out here, what I'd do is figure out the super high difference scores and just sort of look at those. So the plot is a really quick and dirty way to say, oh yeah, there's some really bad outliers, I need to figure this out. Or, oh, you know, most of these dots are pretty close to the one-to-one -one line. Okay. I think you can do that. Rerun this real quick. I think when you create this data set, you can look at it. That is such... um, oh, right, yeah. It's a, it's a list, so it's a, a measure of uh, the different points in space. So you'd have to subtract x minus y and figure out which ones have the highest scores. Okay, so you'd have to convert this to a data frame and kind of do a little bit of, of um, cleanup, but you could figure out which ones had the highest distances, okay, differences in scores anyway. <clears throat> So in summary, um, what we've kind of talked about is starting with dialect and sociolinguistics. So there's a strong interaction of 
language and culture. Uh, and we'll talk about a little bit about Sapir Whorf on a different week, uh, which is a really famous theory that language determines thought. Right? So uh, culture, culture can't really be separated. So instead, we should study it. Right? And think about um, these decisions that we make based on language and how that's actually culturally driven and maybe not um, genetically driven. Uh, and so a good tool for mapping into low dimensional space that would make nice simple models that we could look at would be multidimensional scaling. If you decide that your data cannot be represented by one to three dimensions of space, then you should do what we're going to do next week, talk about principal components analysis and factor analysis. But MDS is just a really like, quick and dirty tool to creating a simple picture of the data. Okay. Cluster analysis is another kind of good way to do this. They're very similar. They both rely on distances. Goal's a little different, but kind of similar analyses. For factor analysis and PCA, we're really kind of looking at what variables have the strongest relationships together, and we'll actually get a measure of how strong the relationship is to their dimension. At the moment, we just kind of know, like, here's where they are in dimensional space. Next week, we'll talk about, like, here's how well that maps onto this dimension. Right? So if I have, you know, a factor of North America, how North America is this language? It's kind of the idea. Um, so we'll get kind of regression weights for that. Uh, and then we'll also do correspondence analysis, which is sort of a mix of multidimensional scaling and principal components where we can actually create categories. And so we'll go back to talking about categories because we did those a couple weeks ago, okay. many like a month ago now. Okay. Um, so in contrast to cluster, this is dimensions of variations rather than just you're in cluster one, you're in cluster two. This allows me to think about uh, you know two or three dimensions. So each piece kind of in, in multiple ways instead of just saying one cluster or two cluster. And the downside to an MDS is that you can't say a whole lot about the location of those points to each other. That's next week's analysis. Okay. So, uh, oh, I don't know why this has a weird dash at the end, but it's not limited to c continuous data. We can actually do multidimensional scaling on categorical variables. You could calculate what's called Gower distances before starting and then use a, a metric multidimensional scale or you can use a non-parametric version of it as well. Okay. So it's not limited to just latitude and longitude. Okay. We could do uh, dialect markers as like yes-no variables as well. 